Hi guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. As you probably realized by now from watching my boa breeding videos, successfully breeding boas is a long and complicated process with many steps involved. So it's understandable that boa breeders are ecstatic when they have a litter of beautiful, healthy babies like this one. However, there's still a number of steps that you'll need to take to get baby boas ready for their new homes. Today I'm going to go over how I care for my baby boas and the steps that need to be taken to get them established and ready for their new homes. If you find this video helpful and you want to learn all about keeping and breeding these beautiful boa constrictors in captivity, please be sure to subscribe to the Brian Boas YouTube channel so you don't miss out on my, any of my upcoming boa videos. Immediately after the babies are born, right after I remove them from the mother, I put them in these 56 quart Sterilite tubs. And you can see I've melted some air holes across the top for ventilation. And then looking inside, it's a pretty simple setup. You can see I just have a simple paper towel substrate. And then I have several paper towels crumpled up to allow for places for the babies to hide as well as a water dish. On one half of the enclosure, you can see I have a ultratherm heat mat, and this is attached to a thermostat that's set to maintain about 90 degrees, and the other side isn't uh, heated. Looking at the babies, you can see these are some Suriname red tails that were just born about three days ago. And typically the babies will just kind of huddle up in the corner. They'll typically form piles on top of each other. And this might be for protection from predators. So in the wild, they might all kind of hang out together. And then if a predator does show up, the predator might eat one of them, but then the rest will be able to escape and get away. So it might be a survival mechanism uh, for dealing with predators in the wild. And usually I just leave them together for about a week to 10 days. They seem to like each other's company uh, during their first few days after they're born. I usually change the paper towels several times right after the born because there's still a lot of afterbirth and debris and I want to get that cleaned out. And then I'll also spray them down once or twice a day with some lukewarm water just to keep them nice and moist. And I'll check the temperatures with a uh, infrared heat thermometer heat gun just to make sure that the temperatures are where I want them. And at, once they reach about seven to 10 days of age, right before their first shed, I'll go ahead and move them to individual tubs. When the baby boas reach about a week to 10 days of age, I move them into racks that I built to hold my baby boa tubs. I have two racks. One rack holds the six liter Sterilite tubs. The other holds the 16 liter Sterilite tubs. And you can see the six liter rack at the top. There's 20 of the smaller Sterilite tubs in there. And this is good for the smaller baby boas like some of the dwarf boas and island boas. Here's another shot of my baby boa rack to hold the six liter Sterilite tubs, or six quart rather. I actually did a video on how I built this rack entitled Baby Boa Rack Build. So you might wanna check that out now for details. I also have a larger rack I built using pretty much the same construction uh, techniques. And this holds the uh, 16 liter Sterilite or 16 quart Sterilite tubs. It actually holds 24 of them, four per shelf. And typically I'll start the smaller boas off in the six quart tubs. And then when they get a little bigger, I'll move them to the 16 quart tubs. And then the larger babies like the true red tails I'll go right away to the larger six quart, 16 quart Sterilite tubs. To heat my baby boa racks, I use a six inch wide ultratherm heat tape of the appropriate length. And I'll just show you how this looks. You can see it's at the back there. You can also see the, temp the thermostat probe that's taped in place. This is hooked up to a Herbstat 6 thermostat to control the temperatures. I have a similar setup for the heating of the larger tubs. You can see the six inch wide ultratherm heat strip. And this one is actually four feet long to cover the whole shelf. And then you can see the uh, thermostat probe in place right there.
I actually took out one of the smaller tubs to show you the setup. You can see I keep it fairly simple. I have a plastic hide on the hot side of the tub. Just a piece of crumpled newspaper. This gives them an additional place to hide and they seem to like to coil around it. You can see the baby crawl key boa is just kind of chilling out. And then for the water I use a system where I use this five ounce deli cup and I use one that's connected to the side with a zip tie and then I have another one that actually holds the water. So it makes it super easy to take it out and clean or just to get rid of the tub or the water dish and change it with a new one. In the larger 16 quart tubs I have a similar setup except you can see there's a larger plastic hide, piece of crumpled newspaper, and I use a larger deli cup. This is a 16 ounce deli cup of water. You can see one that's held to the side, the other one holds the water. The snake is this beautiful little Brarenchia Colombian female. This one I actually didn't breed, but she just wrapped up her quarantine period recently and I moved her down to my baby rack uh, in my snake room. Really looking forward to see how this girl develops. I love the color and marking markings on this Barranquilla boa. You can see I have some of the 16 quart tubs set up with this coconut substrate, coconut husk, and this is better for holding humidity. So I plan on moving some of my true red tail babies in here eventually, just so that they have no issues with shedding. Right around the time that they move down to their tubs, which is right after their first shed, is a good time to take some pictures of your baby boas, just so you can show them off to your friends. And so here is a crawl key female. This is actually a whole back that I decided to keep because of her, the striping on her tail, you might be able to see there. But this is a look at my setup that I use for photographing baby boas. I'll, I get these river rocks, they're nice and smooth and dark and I use these as a substrate for the babies to rest against and they feel really secure because of the texture so they don't move around a lot which is great because when boas move it can be really challenging to photograph them so I have them in this this is another six quart sterilite tub but it makes a good platform to photograph your baby boas and I'll typically will get at least two or three pictures of each baby I like to take a picture from the top and one from the side and these can be used for sales later on and also to keep a visual record of all the babies that you've produced. Stay tuned for a future episode where I go into the composition of photographing boas. You can also see the 3 by 5 inch index cards that I have taped to the front of each tub. And this is how I keep the records. So I just basically write the identification across the top. I give each animal a number starting with one and then going to however many animals there are. And then I write the birth date, when they shed, when they feed, what they feed on, etc. So I have all the records in one place. At this time, I also will sex them. And I use a palpation method that I outlined in my video on determining the gender of your boa. But I'll do this a minimum of two or three times to sex them. And I'll write on the back of the card whether they're male or female. And I do, you can see I've sexed this boa three times. It's been female every time. I put it on the back of the card so that when I'm going for the next round of sex determination, I don't bias my results. And typically I almost always get it the same result three out of three times. And I feel really confident in my sexing using that palpation method. Another important thing to determine when you're doing the sexing is that the animals are free from any defects. And I actually have this animal that has a minor tail kink, which I didn't discover until I went to determine his sex or her sex. I actually don't know the sex of this particular animal because of his tail kink. And I recently did a video on kinks in boas, which you may want to check out. But this animal, because the tail kink is minor, this guy will make a decent pet and he'll be, he or she will be sold at a reduced price to a pet owner for pet purposes only. This is not an animal for breeding. But you want to carefully note if there's any imperfections in your baby boas just so that they can be described accurately. Once you have your baby boas in their individual tubs, the next thing to do is to get them to start feeding. And for this, I'll typically use live mouse fuzzies. 
It's possible to store baby boas on five frozen prey items. This is usually more challenging. So I'll just go ahead and for the first few feedings, I'll use the live mouse fuzzies. I actually maintain a small mouse breeding colony specifically for this purpose. So I'll have available live mice of appropriate size at all times for my baby boas. So usually I'll offer the first food shortly after they shed at about 10 or 11 days of age. I'll typically will put the food with the boa in the hiding place and just give it some time to hopefully eat the food. Usually I'll check back about two hours later to see if the boa has eaten the food. And with some types of boas like the true red tails, they'll almost always start feeding spontaneously. With the true red tails, uh, probably about 80 or to 90% of them will feed on the first food offering. And then those that didn't eat the first time will typically eat on the second or third time. And I rarely have true red tails that won't eat. The same thing is true for many other boas like the tar humaras, um, some of the Central American boas, etc. However, for a lot of the island boas, it's really tricky getting them to feed. For example, with my hog island babies, only about half of them will eat spontaneously. And there are a lot of tricks that you can use to try to get your boas to feed. And in fact, I'm planning on doing an upcoming video where I'll delve into all these different tricks and just give you um, my experience with whether these tricks have been successful or not and how I recommend dealing with picky baby boas that won't feed. But it's pretty typical for a lot of island boas for some of the babies not to eat. I'll typically feed my baby boas every 10 days to two weeks or so. And I make sure they've eaten at least a total of four times before they're ready to go to their new homes. Other weekly maintenance includes changing the water dish and making sure the paper towels are nice and clean, as well as spraying down the tub typically two or three times a week to maintain the proper humidity. So once they reach an age of about two months or so, and they've eaten at least four times. If there's no issues, then they are ready to go to their new home. If there are some issues, I will hold on to them a little longer just to make sure they're well established before they go to their new homes. During this time, I also keep handling of the baby boas to an absolute minimum. I only handle them when absolutely necessary when I'm cleaning the cages. They can be really fragile and delicate, and I wanna give them some time just to adjust to their new life in a boa rack. So they'll be ready to go when they go to their new homes. The last thing that I do, and one of the most enjoyable aspects of having these baby boas, is to select my holdback animals. Like this guy, this is a 2014 Suriname True Red Tail. This was the number one holdback from my first litter of True Red Tails. And he just really stood out right away for his perfect symmetrical peak saddles, his clean background markings, and his long red tail. Just a gorgeous boa. This guy just sired his first litter just last week, as you may have seen my video. So it's really exciting to have a second generation breeding of true red tails here at Brian Boas. When it comes to the whole backs, it can vary. Some litters I don't hold any back. Other litters I might hold half of the litter back, depending on what my future breeding projects are. In general, I might hold back a male and two females that I really like and that really uh, embody my vision for where I want my boa breeding projects to go. One thing I will say is make sure you hold back enough animals because once you sell those animals, you can't get them back. And from some of my early litters, I really wish I had held back more animals. I know everybody wants to keep all their babies and we have a limited amount of space, but you just have to prioritize and figure out exactly what your goals are in breeding boas to decide which animals to hold back. I'll often hold back a few animals more than I think I might want, and then I can sell these at one to two years of age if I so desire. And there's a lot, a big market for uh, well-started sub-adult animals if someone wants to get a jump start on breeding a breeding project. So these animals you hold back will command a premium on the boa market. So those are the steps I go through to get my baby boas established prior to setting them to their new homes. I hope this video was helpful. As always, feel free to shoot me a line if you have any questions or comments. 
Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.